this. All right, yo, we're live. So we're at uh, Ket's studio across the street from his uh, Museum of Graffiti. And I just was thinking about how much work it takes to make something like this happen. And I was listening to some talks that you had before and some interviews and how you're talking about before the Museum of Graffiti came about. It was like a year long process of constant work day in and day out. And like, how was the how was the process to you making it happen? And when did the idea initially spark? The idea sparked a long time ago and it sparked during a time when I started to curate at museums and galleries around the world. And I realized that the museums that I was working for would produce a graffiti exhibition and it would be their most selling or most well attended exhibition. Okay. And that was very curious, right? Because you'd have a Van Gogh exhibit, wouldn't do as well as something having to do with graffiti. And so I was like, wow, you know, people around the world really care about this movement no matter what city you're in. And then I also realized that those institutions weren't collecting graffiti. So they were really hyped on doing an exhibition and spending some money on programming and curating an exhibition and making all the money from it but they wouldn't necessarily put it back into the community. They wouldn't put it back into the artist's pockets by collecting their work and sort of, they were playing a short-term game and not necessarily a long-term game. And so that troubled me a bit. And it sparked in me the notion that there should be an institution, a museum that was focused on presenting this year round and that it could probably be successful. And that also would have the responsibility in collecting and buying this stuff from uh, artists to have in perpetuity and that would really be a great thing for artists because they would suddenly make some money and selling some work and so mm -hmm. it started when I started to do that when I moved to Miami about three years ago I realized that this neighborhood that we're sitting in which is Wynwood was a year-round tourist destination and that folks would come here to look at the walls and walk around the neighborhood and look at graffiti and murals and stuff all the time. And there's about 5 million visitors a year that's projected visit this neighborhood. And this is a pretty small neighborhood. This is, you know, call it, you know, 10 square blocks max. Okay. And so that's a pretty dense area to have that many visitors to come to see art on walls. No one knows anything. They walk around taking selfies. There's no place to learn about it. And so being here, seeing that was the additional spark that I needed to say, hey, this is what should happen. I met my business partner around that time. And when we started to come up with ideas on a new business, this was the one that resonated the most and that we believed would be the best for this neighborhood. Also the best for me as someone who has been collecting and preserving and archiving and really nerding out on this whole graffiti art form or movement. And so it became a no brainer and there was sort of checked mul multiple boxes to like, all right, this could work in this neighborhood and I resigned from my job and started to work on it full time. No, it's honestly amazing. And like when you do something like this, I realize uh, from my perspective, it changes the angle that you look at something like graph from an, from if someone's an outsider and they don't know anything about anything and you see like a throwy on a wall or you see like just like a hand style and like maybe to someone who writes graph stylistically, it looks beautiful. Um, but to them, it just looks like trash. And I think you're changing, you change the medium when you present it, let's say on a canvas or in a form of a sculpture and the form of like a, even like fine art that that writer does outside of like aside from his letters. And it like shows a side of these people who that otherwise are essentially largely misrepresented or misunderstood is just like uh, there is an element to destruction, but just wholly destructive when there's parts of it, like I'm looking at like that, that cess and like with the broccoli and it's like, that's like some creative shit, you know, it's like, you know, that's, that's like his, like a, like a own personal style. Like if you think of like a Van Gogh and how he created his own style, like when I think of like the cess stuff, I think of something that's completely, you know, his own, that he really made his own. And, um, 
you know, it's really sick to be having a museum and especially because you're a part of the whole scene and you know, you know, a good, it's like a good representation. You have the ability to showcase this. You have a, like, you have the power in your hands to showcase it in a specific way. Like you're curating it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that, you know, again, coming and landing in this neighborhood and knowing that there's so many people here that know nothing I realize that there's a real opportunity to educate them, to reveal this world so that they could appreciate it more. So they wouldn't see what they see on the street as just trash or scribbles or dismiss it for not even being able, being able to read it and learn more about the who, the what, the why, uh, some of the psychology around it, some of the, the heroes, the, the legends of this movement, the styles, and so that they have a deeper appreciation for it so that then when they go back into wherever they are living in the world, yeah. that they would say, you know what, we know who this is. We can read that or they appreciate it. You know, they can say, hey, look, that looks like phase two style mm -hmm. from 73 mm -hmm. or whatever. And so we... That's the, some of the work that the museum does. And the museum is focused on sort of telling the history of this movement, preserving it, and trying to elevate the understanding that exists within the public so that perhaps the public is softer mm -hmm. and more uh, caring and more knowledgeable about it so that when they approach teenagers mm -hmm. or adults that do this in their community, they understand that this is not meant to destroy the city mm -hmm. or destroy their lives or hurt them, but it's a, made as a form of expression. Mm -hmm. uh, and that they don't necessarily have to be misunderstanding, but that they could understand and sort of embrace. Mm -hmm. And even if they don't want to embrace it, they have a level of either respect or recognition that will make the exchange between whatever that teenager, that adult that does it, and them different than just trying to maybe shoot them or get them incarcerated. No. Yeah, I think I think it's super important. Like everything you just said. Also, seeing the size of the galleries, it like legitimizes it in my eyes. Also, because for example, in New York City, when there's a show like a graph show, it's like the size of a closet. Or even if there is a big show, it's temporary. You know, like the public doesn't really have the time, or like maybe that person wasn't in that neighborhood to stop by and really check out what's going on. So they just kind of fade away. And like having like, dude, this place is super legit. You know, like it um, legitimizes graffiti so much. And like what you said, it brings um, a different viewpoint to the public. You know, someone that's used to going to museums and art shows, for example, they see like, wow, like graffiti, like in a legit museum that's super professional. Like, let's in see these, what this is these, about. In these, yeah. of, in these like mediums, it's crazy, you know? Yeah, yeah and, and, you, and by the way, we're not even sitting in the museum. We're mm -hmm. sitting in, in mm -hmm. our uh, offices, right? Mm -hmm. This is basically our offices and a satellite gallery mm -hmm. where we're able to represent artists uh, that do create works that are sellable on canvas, which is a very small percentage of what the graffiti community does because we're mostly more concerned with painting on the street mm -hmm and expressing ourselves publicly. So this is a sort of a special niche or a special group of artists that have decided to become professional painters and make that their career because they don't want to be a plumber. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be, you know, work in the post office or be an architect or mm -hmm. a lawyer or whatever. They've chosen to be artists because that's their calling. And so we recognize the power of that, right? We recognize the power of these young people, these adults, these these uh, beings that have decided to dedicate their life to art, and why not celebrate them? We celebrate all types of yep. other artists at other museums and other galleries that have taken a different route uh, and paint what they want to paint, and so we recognize the power of a scene, a power of shoe or sentu or ease mm -hmm. or you know, gel and all, all these other artists that are around or hurt, you know, Cess and these artists that I'm surrounded by, we recognize the power of their art form and, and the beauty of what they do and why not celebrate it and give access to people day in and day out to their artwork. And in the museum in particular, you know, to your point, we have a building. It's a whole building dedicated, you know, to this art form, to this movement, uh, 
in the most professional way. And so in starting a museum, I've never started a museum before. I had to go out and learn what it's like. I had to do, you know, a tremendous amount of research so that I, I would at least, when we opened up, show up on the same level as any other museum. So when you walk into the museum, of course, there's plaques, there's an audio tour, there are people to tour you around, there's a, a thread, a, a timeline, there are objects, there's, there's photography, there's uh, a thought process into the curation, there are different exhibitions at the same time. Uh, there is a well-curated uh, gift shop, there is, you know, great lighting and acoustics and mm -hmm. sound, all the things that matter when you walk into a, a space and you don't want the space to be the obstacle. You want to be able to get into the subject matter really easily. You want it to be something that you can un understand and comprehend. Um, and so we basically did the research. I've you become a museum nerd as a result. And, you know, I look under the... Uh, you know, everything and behind the scenes and really try to understand how other people do it and how other museums are successful and what type of glue they use mm -hmm. and what type of wood they use yeah. and light bulbs and every little thing, every little detail so that we can bring that learning back to this museum so we could be a better mm -hmm. museum and we can, at, you know, meet people. So the people that come to museums go to other museums. Mm -hmm. We want to be minimally at the same level of professionalism no and, and it shows man and like t to me um well like t two things to the things that you were saying is uh one you talk about furthering the understanding of the public through through your museum and i think that's super important man um hurt was on our show and he spoke about his like experience in prison and stuff and he his understanding of uh, what they go through and all that and he he said on the show that um it's this lack of understanding that breeds things like ignorance, that breeds hate, breeds violence, uh, division, and all of these things. And, you know, writers have been killed for, for, just, for just painting, have been shot, you know, and, and then not supported by, by, the, by the system, even when the person who murdered them straight murdered them, you know. And it helps when there's stuff like this to further the understanding. And it gives, it inspires me, honestly, like people like you, Claw, Jess, like they are ear snot. Like they inspire me because, um, you know, I was always ha under the impression that to do something legit and to be uh, any sort of uh, any sort of like monetary success, you can't. Uh, first of all, there's like you can't do it with something that you're passionate about. Like you said, you got to be like a plumber or a lawyer. Or and then I see these people who like grew up essentially with similar interests as I, um, probably somewhat similar mindsets. And I see that, look at this shit, you know? And it's like you you're painting trains uh, at, a, at a young age and like you're into like, you know, hip hop and b-boying and all this stuff. You would think like, ah, uh, he's painting trains. He's on the wrong path. That motherfucker's gonna be a loser. You know, that motherfucker's gonna do nothing. But then there's these people who really do something and not only do something, but they do something great. Like they do something super creative that they have passion in. And like, I admire people who work in stuff that they truly, truly have a passion in and don't just do it for a paycheck. Like the money is a byproduct of doing things that they love. And it's, it goes without saying, like, you know, you're a graph head and, and this is what you're doing. Like, you know, that, that inspires me. I hope to one day be able to do something similar. Well, I think the podcast is something similar. Yeah, I think, trying. you know, you're, you're putting yourself out there and you're deciding to create a product that speaks to the things that you're passionate about and that, and that you uh, like or love in, in the world. And so I think it's a very similar thing. And, and for me, it's a way for me to participate in a, in a very adult way, in a, in a way that is sort of, you know, being professional and not getting the job that I don't want anymore and, and sort of realizing now later on in my life that time is very limited. Exactly. Our lives are very short. And if you can dedicate yourself to the things that you feel passionately about and contribute in a way that you add to the conversation, that's very powerful and could be very rewarding for the soul, for your life. And so... I've made the decision in my life to not necessarily choose money as the barometer for success, as a measure for success for myself. 
and just do the things that I feel like I want to do and, and want to enjoy doing or want to be challenged to do. And it's been totally rewarding from a uh, community level, from uh, the perspective of you know giving and, and being a part of something bigger than just me. Hasn't usually been financially rewarding, uh, and that's okay. You know, it, it's it's just fine. But when, you know, folk, I grew up poor. I grew up in the projects in Brooklyn, and so growing up, my father wanted me to aspire or wanted to inspire me to make money, to have stability, because he felt like we didn't have stability, and so those lessons did resonate with me, and so I decided to go to college. But I also learned other things that maybe weren't just about the stability, but they were more about uh, community and pursuing and following dreams and, and having dreams when you're poor, your dream might just be paying your rent or paying your bills. When you uh, achieve that, then, then what? You know, your dreams might be over by that time, perhaps. I don't know. For me, growing up poor and being poor early on, uh, going to college sort of m maybe ruined that for me in a way where I was radicalized in, in some way to think that, you know, uh, I can do whatever I wanted to do in my dreams and wasn't necessarily uh, driven by finance. And this thing, this museum, much like other uh, businesses or some that I've started in the past have been driven more by the passion to create, to preserve, to tell our stories. And you know, I was a, a communication major and got into journalism in school. And so it, it put me on a different path and understanding that there, there are lots of important things. And one of the important things in, in my life is sharing our, our struggle, sharing our story. Uh, because it is unique to us and it happens to be in the graffiti world and so this art form I learned is pretty powerful it's fairly new um, and it's just something that I've fallen in love with in, in my lifetime that I wanted to contribute to and, and keep pushing it and so now I'm 50 and I don't really uh, dream of bombing at all you know those sort of things are or you know, things that I thought about when I was much younger, now I dream of celebrating the bombers and celebrating the heroes and, and the builders and the pioneers and the different people of this movement so that they can be recognized for building an art form that's one of the biggest art forms or, you know, people want to say one of the biggest communication styles or vandalism styles or whatever movements of our lifetime. And, uh, and, you know, to do that, it requires a lot of work and commitment. And I think for me, the museum is one way to do that work. I've done it in books. I've done it in, you know, publishing in, in the past. Museum seems like it's something that should exist, not just here in Miami, because this is a small city, but it should exist in cities around the world to tell the story of their art movement or this art movement to those people. You know, one of the things that you mentioned before is this notion of negativity when it comes to you know graffiti and so at the museum we talk about that there's a section that we call historical negativity which speaks on this uh, movement being downplayed or ridiculed or or stigmatized by our teachers our family our siblings our parents and how that really makes this a very challenging path for whoever wants to do it you know i remember i can't tell you how many beat downs i got from my pops for doing this and how he tried to break my spirit from doing this by throwing out all my belongings, my photos, my everything to, to try to break me and it didn't really work. It ended up making me run away from home and bounce and you know, being like, you know, I'm, I'm, I belong to the wrong family, you know, not I'm gonna stop doing this. And so that sort of historical negativity that exists that, it, that people are indoctrinated into makes people that do this very unique and very special and and rebels and a special kind of rebel a special kind of artist and so these are not the artists that are sort of coddled and and developed to go to art school and become that way not typically um, 
these are some special kind of rebel beings that we celebrate and mostly come from, you know, many come from broken homes or single parent homes. Uh, many are, are, have struggled in their life and that's a common thread. Some of the lucky ones, mostly they're Europeans or, you know, they come from very stable household and a different understanding and they don't have the historical negativity because their parents saw Style Wars mm -hmm. with them and they thought it was very cool and very creative and they would take them to the store and buy them spray paint and then go to the wall and hang out and paint with them. Mm -hmm. And that always blew me away. So there's all kinds of people that come into this, but it's definitely a rebel spirit. And we love that and we celebrate that and we tell the story of these rebellious kids and these you know rebellious people that didn't listen to their teachers that didn't listen to their parents that suffered that caught beat downs that were you know many, many times thrown out of their homes because they were misunderstood mm -hmm. you know and uh there's a lot of success stories here mm -hmm. i want to say like immense thank you honestly for like what you're doing with the community because there's a big word you said is celebrated, you know, because I feel like any kid that gets into this subculture, that's what they're lacking. You know what I mean? They feel like alienated from like their family, from the, from society, all these conditionings. And they, that's why they start this. They want like a sense of community. They want a sense of the rebellion, you know? So like the fact that it's being celebrated on like, on like a platform like this, like clean and cut, it's, it's amazing. You know, it brings it to a different level. It, um, it, it kind of brings it out of the gutter, you know what I mean? Like going back, to, we were talking earlier how with your museum, you do a program with the youth, like kids. I think that's super important because it shows even the parents. You were saying how you bring different artists and like they do like art classes and activities with the kids. And I think that's important because even the parents, they're like, you know, this is, this is not some criminals, you know, this is some shit my little kid is so into, you know, they're enjoying, they want to go back. You know, I think that's very important. The, the notion of writers as artists is something that not everybody believes in or identifies with, but I do. I think that you know, writing and, and starting to, to tag could very well be the beginning of a life of art, no, a absolutely. lifetime uh, of a career in art or a, a, just a life in art. And so if you were to harness that, and develop that and push that and not scoff at it and, and try to stifle it, you can have the next scene, yeah. right? As your child or as the young, the young person or the next uh, you know, Banksy or, or whoever it might be. And so the people that come here with their children understand that. They understand that their children need love and support and if that's something that they want to explore that they should explore it and not be scared of it mm -hmm. and see what happens and learn and and they see their children as potential artists they, mm -hmm. they see those doodles as potential artwork one day and so that's really powerful versus when you know, you have a parent that looks at them and like, you know, tells you to like cut the bullshit and, and like stop like wasting paper, you know, or, or stop, you know, drawing Pokemon that's like some trash, you know, and it's a different way. And so we try to model the good in this and say, look, your kid might want to doodle. That just means he maybe is interested in art. You can explore this art, but maybe you should also go and do like comic book drawing classes or painting class different whatever it is because that kid is into art this is just one manifestation of it you know the the people that are from this movement from this subculture these writers chose this as a style of art but a lot of them do other styles of art some of them are sculptors mm -hmm. some of them might be um, you know, collage artists, they do whatever. Some of them are muralists. It's different styles. This is just an entry point or one type of style that they love to do. And uh, once we start thinking about this in a way that there is artistic merit, even in a hand style, it can make people shift and see it in a different way. Now, we live in a society that's very um, challenging to live in where everything is very expensive and people care about real estate uh, more and value more than they care about human life sometimes and so in this capitalist uh, society that we live in it's very challenging when the laws put 
more uh, value on the side of a building than on the kid that might decide to tag on the side of a building. And so there's a lot of things that we need to fix and shift our thinking about in order to be able to be more loving and uh, kind to, to humans and especially to teenagers and to kids that we have to work on. And I think that us really being aware of the power of this movement, whether it's a rebellious uh, form that goes out into the street to protest or just to say I'm here and the tags or they ha you know there's other things to say or if it comes into the galleries and there's great paintings or museums and there's or murals around the world that are saying stuff like all of it has value no, you know absolutely. and if we recognize that you know I think it's a it's a powerful thing you know we talk about this movement a lot of times internally uh, amongst writers as as vandalism and we say words like Dis we're going to go out and destroy this thing and you're not destroying anything you're adding paint to a surface that's not destructive that's coloring mm -hmm. right like don't make yourself act like you know like you're some kind of a viking killer yeah, yeah. you're not mm -hmm. you're actually an artist with spray cans like if killers go out and like pick up guns and kill people mm -hmm. you're going to destroy something you need a molotov cocktail or something mm -hmm. not like a marker you know so it's really funny that we create this loaded language of destruction when you're actually more like a comic book geek than a villain, no, you know? And so it's, it's, it always cracks me up like, oh, we're gonna go bomb the yard and destroy. We've built up this language to make ourselves seem so tough, mm -hmm. but we're not tough, mm -hmm. you know? Um, we're actually more inclined on the art side, even if you hear artists, well, you know, like in some of your past interviews that are really talking eloquently about how tags are like, you know, this force of, destruction and and it's not destruction mm -hmm. you're not destroying anything you think so because you're this you came up with this teen angst mm -hmm. you know and like you're misunderstood and you want to get out and like you know yell at everybody but if you were really destructive you'd just go out and start punching people in the face and that would be it no and the thing is too it's like i think that there's in the society that we're living in uh, there's this idea that discipline is one thing and hard work is one thing and like play is another. So, for example, if you see a little kid and uh, they spend night and day, let's say, coloring and like working on their drawings, uh, it's, it's common that like the parents and teachers would be like, yo, he's, he's like lazy, he's scattered brain and he's uh, undisciplined. Whereas the kid who spends all, the same amount of time maybe just uh, reading a book because maybe he's a reader, um, that one's disciplined, this one's like kind of foolish. And instead of feeding, like you said, the, the, the person who's inclined to art and drawing, art and drawing, you say no and you bring him into, that's like taking the person who hates drawing and loves reading and being like, no more books for you and now you're gonna be, you're gonna draw. And you, for, you, you know, you force everyone into this one mold and it's really not like that. And like I've, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have had like that sort of experience like growing up with uh, their teachers or their, their parents and like your interests are not the ones that are valid. You have to do these other ones. And it's, it's important to have a shift in that mentality. So then that way we can approach the way we, you know, raise the youth or even interact with them differently. You know, like nowadays anything can be a career. There's kids who play video games that more money, that make more money than doctors. So if this kid is playing video games 24 seven, I'm not saying don't make them well balanced, you know, and understanding like just general education and having a little bit of everything. But if this is clearly his strong suit, it's like you take a puncher and you try to make him a grappler. You should take a grappler, you try to make him a puncher. Like he got a specialty, you should feed that specialty and then just well around the rest. You know what I mean? And you came up in a time period where can, you know, is largely looked at as like one of the fantasy lands, like the mystic the the so much legend behind it like the early new york city graffiti you know bombing trains and uh the people you came up with are just all like all these stories how was your experience uh and how do you think that shaped your mind and led you to become who you were the 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 whole thing around growing up in the 70s and the 80s in in new york city uh, has been romanticized. And we look back at it, even when I grew up, I romanticized or like, you know, I have fantasies about 70, early 70s, like, oh, I wish I was in, in the train yard in 74 instead of 88, you know, it was, it was so much better. When the era that I grew up in with the people that I grew up with was a really tough time. You know, the mid 80s and the late 80s in New York City, you know, for, for us, 
who were misfits, teenagers, you know, it was really, really challenging and very dangerous and very tough. I can't, I can't tell you how crazy it was. You know, I went to high school from 84 to 88, traveling from Williamsburg where I grew up to Flatbush every day where I went to high school was like a mission every single day. You didn't know what kind of people you're going to bump into, what type of violence was going to happen, if you're going to get robbed, if you were going to, it was just crazy. You know, and I think that teenagers back then and maybe even now are very loose with each other. They're very prone to violence, uh, especially young boys. And, and during that time, there was just a lot of crime. The city was poor. Uh, if you moved around the city, you were prone to get into stuff fights, violence. And so, you know, I fell in with a band of guys, you know, my crew, uh, risk crew and AOK crew. And we were a bunch of misfits from different parts of the cities that just loved to paint trains and hang out. And we got into all kinds of trouble going into different neighborhoods, getting jumped and, you know, getting into fights. And then, you know, we then learned and toughened up and got into, we became the troublemakers. And so there was this sort of rite of passage in New York growing up where the city and the conditions of the city really toughen you up and really prepare you to be like these little warriors because if not, you get hurt. Not that you won't get hurt anyway, but you gotta get tough quick because the city was just such a tough place to be in. And so for me, uh, Growing up and, and going around the city and spending a lot of time in Bushwick and Flatbush and Williamsburg and in the Bronx, uh, I got robbed plenty of times as a kid by older bullies and kids for my money or my watch or whatever random valuable thing it was. And then I turned around and wasn't having it anymore. And I started carrying around weapons every day. And I remember a time in my life where I wouldn't leave my home in Brooklyn without a weapon. And it was like weapons check before you hit the door. And I carried all kinds of insane weapons, you know, from ice picks to machetes to, you know, eventually a gun. And that's what it was like growing up in, in that era. It was dangerous and crazy. Um, but we were also writers and so we weren't really the crazy ones the crazy ones were the ones that were hugging the block you know selling crack or selling heroin and that all did have guns and all were ready to kill you because they were holding uh, a lot of drugs or a lot of money or they were actually like you know involved in breaking and entries entries and and hurting people you know and we were just trying to not be hurt you know um, on the graffiti side of thing, during that time, it was an incredible time because there was so many uh, writers active and the trains were filled with names. Like you could sit on a train station anywhere in the city and watch some incredible free art every single day. It was wild. You can jump on the train and the trains were wallpapered filled with names. And I remember as a kid sitting on the inside of the trains and being in, in marvel of all the names, like hundreds of names and then trying to fit my name in the train. And there was no room to even tag a little bullshit name. Like I remember learning and being a kid and wanting to write my name on the inside of the train and really finding no room. It was outrageous. It made me go and paint on the outside instead of the inside because on the outside at least you can cover something up mm -hmm. and hide it and put your name over it very easily. Um, but it was, it was, you know, on that sense, it was a magical time. It was a magical, crazy time to be growing up where graffiti was so present. In my neighborhood, in Williamsburg, it was on the walls everywhere tags and throw ups and pieces in the staircases of your building, you know, on the train stations, on the pillars, on the platform, on the trains, on the rooftops. It was a city that was completely covered. And I guess much like the way it is today, mm -hmm. with the exception of the trains, even though they're getting covered as well. Um, but there were there was a lot of people participating. So it was really, really wild. And you never knew who these people were. You would see the, their name, some word, Adam, or Old English, 
or phantom or ghost or blade or and you'd be like who the hell is doing that what is that who what does that even mean why mm -hmm. did he choose to do that in that way um and all different styles and it became for me when i started to understand it a very curious thing that i wanted to learn more about and then i finally met people that did it and it was like i it was like being gifted the holy grail or something like whoa this is what it is like this is you you how did you do that so it was very 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 interesting um and i wouldn't change it for the world even though i'd rather have gr grown up in the early 70s to paint when when there was no fences on the train yards so it was like a life path and and, and seriously like a learning experience it, it was i think it really toughened me up like i explained it made me see the possibilities of doing whatever i wanted you know, like you put in you get in you get what you put in and so it made me see the world through the eyes a bit of like a marketer mm -hmm. like i want that spot i want to do that i want that that's like marketing people think like that you know guerrilla marketers uh it made me think that i had power over things you know like i'm going to claim that building i'm going to claim that train yard i'm going to claim that wall and I'm going to assert myself on it. I'm going to take control of it. It's sort of a powerful, dominant way to see the world. And it made me think that if I achieved that, which I did over and over again and got away with it, I sort of can achieve anything that I want to achieve. And so I think that I learned early on because of being a writer that you can do whatever you want to do. You can succeed. You just got to figure out how to do it. You don't know how to get up on that building? Well, figure it out. You don't know how to get into that train yard, figure it out. And then if you could figure that out, well, figure out how to launch this company, mm -hmm. figure out how to do this, figure out how to get that client, figure out how to make that thing happen. And that's something that I think that growing up in that era and being a writer gave me that attitude and gave me that skill set or that mindset that was like, you know what, like we can do this. And, and people ask me all the time, like, yo, how'd you do whatever? How'd you do this? When I was like, by doing it, like you just start and then you put one foot in front of the next foot. And then next thing you know, you've already done it. So, um, I'm of the belief system that if you put your mind to it, you train yourself, you can figure it out and you can achieve whatever success it is that you want to. Yeah. Achieve. There's like a lot of power in yourself, a lot of personal power and just almost just like DIYing, you know, that's a big part of craft. And like, you just, like you said, get up to get onto the roof. Uh, how do I do this? How do I make stickers that can't get peeled off? Okay. They're buffing this. What are they not buffing? Paying attention, you know, uh, maybe try some edge, maybe try some scribes. Uh, they put this plastic thing on the train, you take it off, you, you know, you're, you're, you're maneuvering and you're maneuvering. And I can imagine that's much the same way that you've approached this, this museum project, because you know, you, you majored in communications, you didn't major in business administration. You don't have a, an MBA or anything like that. You just, you know, you just made it happen and it's like you don't even need one, you know, because you made it happen regardless. Well, it's the same thing with writers that are successful as painters, as fine artists. Many of them are self-taught. They didn't go to art school, but they spent a lot of time with their own practice learning how to be better and better and better and better and so, until they had some success. And so they probably didn't learn, they probably didn't have an MBA either mm -hmm. or a degree in finance or whatever to figure out how they're gonna operate their business or their studio. But if you want to succeed, you're gonna have to learn. Like that's just the way it works. And you know, school is sort of one way to learn. You mentioned this before, going to school, getting an MBA, getting, a degree in community, those are one way to approach life and, and one way to have uh, possibly some success and have knowledge, but you can be totally self-taught. You know, the way that we're all connected now on the net and, you know, through, you know, shared, you know, platforms of knowledge, like you can go out and learn remotely, independently, and not have to give. And be an expert. And be an expert, and then go out and practice, and practice, and practice, and not have to go out and give a school twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year, like save it, and invest it in yourself. And so I think that there's lots of ways to approach any problem or any mission. Um, my way has been more, like you said, like more of a DIY way and and research and do it and figure it out and meet experts and ask a lot of questions and and apply 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 and learn and apply and fail and get up again and keep and keep at it and so 
you know, ultimately what I've chosen to do today as my professional career uh, is to open up a museum to celebrate this art form that I grew up uh, looking at, this vandal form, this, you know, this movement, this subculture, whatever you want to call it, that was everywhere and that was misunderstood and that is still everywhere more so than ever before any city in the world has it and I identify with the kids that bomb with the teenagers that bomb and the problems that they might be having as a result of that and I want to pitch in my hat so that they, I can ed teach their parents, I teach their grandparents, the museum teaches those people so that those kids don't have to go through necessarily the hardship that I went when my parents as new immigrants didn't understand this shit and they just didn't really want cops to kill me. That's really the reason why they hated graffiti because they understood that I was taking a risk in doing something that was um, against the society's rules and that a cop could show up and just shoot me and then they'd lose their son. Um, and so that hasn't changed. But I also invite the police to come into the, into the building, the judges, the lawyers, the DAs, whoever wants to learn because the, the people that write on walls around the world aren't bad people. They just love to write. That's it. It's not a bad thing, it's just writing. Yeah. And the paint fades with the sun. You know, and, and so, you know, we're, we're very harsh society here in the United States that really punishes uh, people that are radical or mm -hmm. counterculture uh, and that don't approach society with the level of respect that's demanded by the wealthy, right? Um, it's the world, the whole world is not like that. You know, it's, it's an exception. We are an exception in that way. Some places are harsher than this. Most places that I've seen are much more lenient. When they look at graffiti, they say, hey, on the, out, on the street, they're like, that's what young people do. Mm. Like, it's just what it is. Mm -hmm. When those young people that just did that grow up, they might not do it. The next group of young people are going to do it. It's part of society, mm -hmm. and they don't fight it in the same way. They might buff it if they want to, if they want to maintain the color of a building. In a lot of societies, they'll just leave it because they just know it just keeps it's growing and growing, and it's a cycle, and it's no big deal mm -hmm. at all. Yeah, I think getting those community officials and, like you said, introducing cops and like making them realize what this is really about is important because recently like all those people went on like the news channels in New York City um, and they were because they want to do like a cleanup of all the graffiti because essentially like COVID allowed you know a lot of graffiti to take place in the city and um, what they pretty much said was that with the help of the community we'll be able to clean it up if you see like someone writing just call it in or like you, we, you can buff it yourself and this and that pretty much it's like a war like they want to go against it they want to turn the people against this art form so like hearing you I think everybody needs to hear what you have to say about this, you know what I mean? Because it makes them open up their minds and be like, yo, why would I rat on that kid if, if we can just understand the root of why he's doing that? You know what I mean? He's trying to truly express himself because- And, if it and wasn't also change the way the buildings look. Yeah. Like your building might be, like we're looking at a black building outside. Mm -hmm. It's a really boring color yeah. building. It's almost oppressively boring. <laughs> Right. And so those light blue tags yeah. and yellow tags on it actually make that building look more interesting yeah. Yeah. than the shitty way that it looks right now. And so especially if, if you understand the history behind it, you're like, oh, dude from Philly. Oh, dude from somewhere else, right. you know, like. Yeah. yeah. But even for me, who, who I don't know the kid from Philly and I don't I'm, I just like that. It's not this whack looking building yeah. across the street that it gives it some life. I know people are alive if I see there's writing on the buildings. And so. If in New York City, as an example, when they have these press conferences mm -hmm. to make people seem so square about cleaning up the city, if the news agencies were to, re to call up someone like Espo, mm -hmm. who knows how to speak very eloquently about graffiti, or someone else and ask them their opinion, mm -hmm. they would get a really interesting counter opinion to what's being proposed by the square individuals that want the whole city to look the same way that it looks everywhere. Or if they asked me, I'd say, let them write on all the buildings. Your building looks so boring and shitty before it. Now look at it. 
there's actually life in here. Maybe you want to reopen a bar instead of another, like, you know, high-end boutique, right? People want to be alive in the city. And so when people don't understand that th those things aren't, aren't going to hurt you, the names on the walls, the spray paint on the walls, they, they don't hurt you. They don't mean to hurt you. They don't say, kill your mother. They say, Iraq or whatever, you know, like all of a sudden you don't, aren't fearful of it. You don't think that it's there designed to hurt you. And then once you, if you were to grow up as a kid that came to the Museum of Graffiti with their parents at five years old, by the time you're 20 years old, you're not gonna be that square that's asking to get fines put on for graffiti in the building because you're gonna understand that, that these are people just like you, mm. but that they wanna express themselves publicly instead of maybe on the internet, mm. whatever. And so there's just this way of society being very oppressive and being very much cookie cutter and supposed to be very neat and that looks chaotic and we can't have and people can't handle chaos and the reason why people can't handle chaos sometimes it's because they it's presented that way because to me it doesn't really look that chaotic mm -hmm. right they're separating their names they're not writing all over each mm -hmm. other it's it's fine but if you go to school and you're taught to sit in that chair and only speak when you're you, you're allowed to raise your hand and all this other ways that we indoctrinate you know, people to be in society so that we can be manipulated and controlled. Yeah, we're going to be calling to get teenagers arrested and thrown in jail because we're not thinking for ourselves. We're thinking mm -hmm. as sheep, you know, and so it's 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 hard to to live in, in a society that can be so oppressive to young people or to free expression or to rule breakers. Or to anything that isn't in this narrow narrow yeah. scope. Yeah, the only people that are allowed to break rule, rules are the ones that have lawyers to help them break the rules and argue for them, right? So you have to be rich to break rules, basically. Like, it's, it's really, really unfortunate that we live in such a uh, society where what is allowed is only what's allowed under law and then the only people that can break the law and get away with it are people that can afford mm -hmm. to really challenge things and so if all those taggers had ill lawyers you know what would happen tagging would be legal mm -hmm. eventually like we would have we would hire our own lobbyists to go to the governor and to go to the state and you know what tagging would be legal the same way now psychedelic mushrooms are legal in california that's just people paying money mm -hmm. to like change the rules exactly but we're on the streets we're not in the in the boardrooms we're, yet we're yep. not we're not hiring lobbyists yet you know but eventually we will you know there'll be maybe cause if you're listening to this or banks if you're listening to this or whoever that's already a futura that's making so much money Let's hire some lobbyists. Let's mm -hmm. change the rules and really change the game. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. It's, it's an interesting time to be an adult and care about writing and, and feel like there is a, a, a potential to change the way things are. Um, and so, you know, we're doing the work that I do and the work that we do as a museum is a small piece of it that I think could have long term effects mm -hmm. in a positive way for the lives of writers, for society, for, you know, communication between us, um, you know, and, and, and I'd like to think that it's work worth doing. No, it is. And, you know, there's a, like the founder of judo, this guy, Jigoro Kano, he talks about how, like, when people think of like judo, they think of a martial art of just fighting. And he talks about how, like, there's three levels. He says the first level is knowing how to defeat other, other men. Uh, the second level is knowing how to like defeat yourself and then he said the third is like your level is so high that what you're doing is you're contributing back to society which is like a big thing in like japanese culture is like what can i do for the whole for the community for the society and i think that it's really interesting thinking about that and like analyzing it with uh what you're doing because this is essentially like another level of graph in a way you know and and uh just like through what you're saying i can see that it's more than just like, all right, cool. I'll have like a Giz statue and I'll make some bread. There's a underlying uh, passion behind it about f furthering knowledge, furthering a message, and just uh, sh showcasing this thing that has had such an influence on your life and it ha has had such an influence on mad other people's lives um, to the general public. Because although this is something that writers can see and they can bug out on these pieces, 
uh, you know, non-writers are going to, there's probably going to be primarily non-writers who come here and they're going to be seeing it in this way for the first time in their life. And with that, what you're doing and, and all the events and like the Rikers Island thing you did and like all these things that you've done, these book publications and speaking and stuff like that. It's like a, it's like a betterment for the community. So I want to say thank you. And like, thanks for, you know, allowing us to come here and speaking on the show and everything, bro. No, it's my pleasure, man. And, and you're right. It is, it is a community vibe. And I think, you know, when, when you grow up and you realize that the world is bigger than you, right? And that if you want to make change, you, you start with yourself, then, you know, your sort of immediate circle, your family, and then you just get bigger and bigger. And, and so for me, I, I realized that, you know, maybe this goes back to communication in, in college or whatever, Tony Robbins or whatever things that might have touched me along the way. Like you can make a wide impact mm -hmm. in whatever it is that you want to do. You just have to decide who do you want to impact and how do you want to do it. And, and so the museum is designed to, to impact people. And so when they come in, you're right, most of the people that come to the museum know nothing about it. They're not writers. They're from some part of the world that's not filled with graffiti. Um, and they have an idea that graffiti is gang culture. And then when they walk through it, that n notion quickly disappears and they're presented with new ideas, a new notion of graffiti as a movement, as a subculture of artists that are counterculture and rebellious, funky, cool, nerdy, weird, into color, into lettering and bending and shaping them and twisting them around and very expressive and very um, into art. And they leave, with, they leave buying a book about it you know, buying a t-shirt about it, you know, that celebrates it, and they leave uh, mostly as, as supporters with a new understanding that what they see on the streets or on the freight trains, because most people see it on freight trains first in America, um, is not gang culture. It's just some person that wants to express himself publicly for kicks or for art or with their friends, and now they all of a sudden they respect it more and see it as something meaningful, not just as like, you know, trash, yeah. right? And so, you know, that's the, the thing that we love to do, and we do it every day, and we've trained the staff to do that every single day. So every day we're converting people, you know? Every day we're converting people to give respect to phase two, and to case two, and to Lady Pink, and to Ghost, and Giz, and West, and whoever. You know, all these writers from all over the world, and they leave there like, yo, we can't believe that we didn't know about this. And they don't know about it because this is not mainstream yet. It's mainstream because uh, Supreme hires a lot of writers mm -hmm. to do designs that look really cool. So it's mainstream because it's in product. It's mainstream because it might be on your TV and some commercial, but the information, the knowledge, the, the understanding of it isn't. And so that's the work that we do, and we're very, very hyped and very excited that we get to do this. You know, it means a lot to us because we know that every day we're converting another person, another person, another person, and that goes out and goes out and it reverberates. And so it's, uh, it's, it's work, but it's good work. It's work that I'm happy that, that I do, that we do. Um, and yeah, and hopefully, you know, we learn how to really do this museum thing really, really well and the museums around and outlast me in my lifetime. And, uh, and then I'll think that we've been successful. Well, thank you so much, man. Yeah, thank you, man. It was of course. an honor. Peace. Peace.